So uh, my, my title today is asking a question that was mentioned in the introductory remarks, who is the artist when we're talking about art uh, and artificial intelligence? Well, in my book, Unthought, I defined what I called cognitive assemblages. Uh, and these are collectivities through which information, interpretations, and meanings circulate. As I define them, they can include humans, non-humans, and also cognitive media. So cognitive assemblages always imply distributed cognition and distributed agency. And the art I'll be talking about today qualifies as cognitive assemblages. So as we mentioned in the introduction, it's not always obvious what one means when one talks about artificial intelligence. Um, so I'll specify what I mean in this presentation. I'm talking about self-learning, self-evolving, and self-assembly algorithms. This would include genetic algorithms, evolutionary algorithms, complex system software, generative antagonistic networks, recurrent neural nets, and convolutional neural nets. So the question I'll be addressing is this, what factors influence how creators think about their software collaborators? And I am specifying here that software is a collaborator in these productions. So I'll be talking about uh, three artists, Casey Rias, I had a joint appointment in the design media arts uh, department at UCLA for six years. So he was my colleague here uh, at UCLA. John Cayley, who is in the literary arts program at Brown University, and then an independent author, uh, Alado McDowell. So going to Casey Rias, I'll uh, appropriate the title to one of his lectures, which I think, um, defines his attitude quite nicely. The thing that makes the thing is always more interesting than the thing. And the thing here, of course, is the software. So in his book, Form Plus Code, uh, he quotes with approval this uh, quotation from Nichols. The computer is more than just a production tool. It is an active, intellectual and active creative partner that when fully exploited could be used to produce wholly new art forms and possibly new aesthetic experiences. So you see why I say software is the collaborator. And in this book, uh, Casey talks about a series of algorithmic operations, including repeat, transform, uh, para, para, uh, parameterize, visualize, and simulate. And here you see two different treatments of alphabetic letters to illustrate some of those processes. So in his artwork, he uses the software, often generative antagonistic networks, to create many, many variations that take a database of elements through different kinds of transformations. He flips through these at speed, and those that he strike him as interesting, he then saves as an image or a video clip. So he very much relies on his artist's eye, his visual aesthetic to identify which out of these many, many variations uh, have artistic merit. So let's take a look at uh, one of these processes. This is a uh, YouTube so this is another piece from that Casey is, uh, showing a whole series of images yeah, being constructed called, uh, and then deconstructed uh, through generative antagonistic networks. And it's put to a kind of a amazing soundtrack. So you'll hear some sound here as well. And we're seeing the image being created and then taken apart and created again through a different combination of the elements taken apart, created again, over and over. And you see how the same set of basic elements can lead to very different designs.
So um, when he deals with text, uh, he also performs some of these same transformations. So he started on a project he called One Point Perspective. His interest here was in how data is transformed and transmitted, and he was dealing with the older and static medium of newspapers, specifically the Washington Post. So he took the Post's front page through a series of transformations. Here you see it being scanned and uh, elongated. Here it's being broken up into visual blocks. Here it's being broken up in a different way. Here it's being broken up even further. Now you see an inversion where white becomes black, black becomes white. Here you see some image interspersed with text and then different kinds of treatments of those textual blocks. Uh, this is a different kind of um, treatment also with the newspaper, but now the New York Times front page, uh, the image that appears above the fold of the Times. And you see that this could become a time sequence where if you look at any slice of these diagonal slices in the next, uh, the second line down, you'll see that it's moved one space to the left. And then on the third line, you see it's moved yet one more space to the left. So you can imagine how this then comes transformed into a temporal sequence. So what can we infer about uh, Risa's relationship here with his software collaborator. He talks about being happy with the work, finding joy in creation. He's the co-inventor of the uh, computer language he uses process. So he has complete fluency with the tools. He does view the software as a partner, but it is very much a junior partner. Uh, and the emphasis here is on his own aesthetic vision, as he says, I trust my eye. So now we'll uh, look at a different case study. Don Cayley uh, from Brown University, who is a poet, a sinologist, a translator of Chinese texts. He also, for some years, was the co-owner of a books, bookshop specializing in ancient Chinese manuscript. So uh, Keeley often uses the idea of transliteration, and he's playing here on the Latin root of letter and literate. Uh, both have the same Latin root. So to try to explain what he means by transliteration, I'm asking you to imagine one of those old fashioned railway signs where they have the flipping letters and uh, the letters flip around to form a new destination. So we could imagine, for example, Singapore being transformed to Beijing. And if you could imagine that you had supervision and you could see those letters before they stop, you might imagine that you would see something that's a combination of Singapore and Beijing. So this is a transition, a transliteral representation, as it were, between the stabilized forms of the letters. So as a translator of Chinese texts, um, Kaylee is uh, very conscious of the difference between alphabetic language and ideogrammatic language such as Chinese. So he thinks of the alphabet as a digitization of sound. So you have a small set of elements, 26 letters in English, out of which you can make an infinite number of combinations. And neurological research by Stanislaw Dehane in a wonderful book called Reading in the Brain shows that once one learns to read, the brain's relationship to language is forever changed. That uh, the brain now hears um, letters forming phonemes and the phonemes become much more distinct. So you can think of speech as a continuous stream of sound. When you translate, you're looking for verbal equivalents to those sounds, 
but in transliteration, you're interested not so much in the stabilized form of the phonemes, but the spaces between those phonemes. So here you see the first screen of a wonderful work called River Island, and you see that the words don't form recognizable, the letters don't form recognizable words. That's because they're in the process of transliterating from one set of words uh, to another. So the work is um, can be visualized as two wheels with 16 uh, spaces in them. Uh, the One of the wheels is a, a vertical wheel and it gives 16 translations of the same poem. The other wheel is a horizontal wheel and it gives 16 poems from the Wang Wei River sequence. And some of you may know those famous uh, river poems. So the interface looks like a stream. And as you navigate down the stream, you go from island to island and you will hear the poem at one island begin to fade and the poem at the next island come into uh, visibility. So we'll listen to a soundtrack of what that listen, what that sounds like from River Island. You can hear the water just lapping a little bit. You're going down the stream and soon you'll come to an island and you'll begin to hear a poem being read by Kaylee. Alone. Hearing voices of something past on empty slopes. Now you can begin to hear the, the next island appear. So there's a sound now the from the second time. island as well. That second sound so will become louder and louder. And then you'll it'll clarify and then you'll begin to go on to the next poem as well. So here's um, two different translations of the same poem, and you'll see how different they are. Alone, hearing voices of something past, echoes where the moss bank shines as it did before, returning each evening to this lakeside. But now in the second version of the same poem, you'll see how different the poem sounds. On empty slopes, we see nobody, yet we can hear men's echo phrases. So the translator has chosen to introduce uh, a character, we, that was not in the first version at all. Um, so Kaylee created this lovely little uh, quick time movie to illustrate the fluidity of language thoughts as they move between alphabetic and idiogrammatic languages. Empty is the first word of that first translation of the first poem. You'll see the transformation here visually. And those you who read Chinese will, of course, be able to read these letters, which I can. So, in this little video, you can see why. He wants to emphasize the space between words because of this fluidity of language. Now we'll go back to our PowerPoint. Uh, so that's uh, working in programs that uh, Kaylee is very familiar with. But recently he has started working with artificial intelligence and he uh, began by 
uh, doing some programming, which you can do through a so-called skill app on top of Alexa. And this is his comments about his programming of the Alexa system. The listeners have their own interaction model. They listen and speak in their own way as designed and scripted by the artist using the distributed cloud-based voice recognition and synthetic speech. So we'll just listen to a very brief clip of this. Alexa, ask the listeners. Welcome. We are listening to you insofar as we are with you. It is a pleasure. It is such a pleasure. It is a pleasure to be with you. Always, always a pleasure. You may always tell us to or go on. You may describe your feelings by saying the words, I am overwhelmed by, and then one of the minor effects. So Kaylee is uh, experimenting here with the idea that you could script affects. And at one point he tells Alexa he's very angry and she expresses her dismay at this and says how much she loves Kaylee. So we're beginning to get into that slippery territory where um, AI is now being treated in a completely anthropomorphic way. And of course, Kaylee is acutely aware of all of the ironic tensions of that. And he points out in this quote that if you set Alexa up and leave her, she will listen to everything that's happening in the room. And when she hears the wake word, she will transmit this information back to Amazon's Alexa voice services. And Kaylee wonders what this means about our sense of privacy. And he asks, when ever more devices are enhanced and powered by the voice services of big software, what then? Will everything in the world of human orality be perfectly surveilled? And you notice the strange spelling here of orality, aurature and aurality, I think alluding to the human aura and suggesting that the human aura itself may be challenged by these uh, AI applications. So we see here skepticism and concern. Uh, and notice that Kaylee is really not in control of this software. He can only add on top. Uh, so he has a keen sense of what is lost here as well as what is gained. And he suggests that in this case, the artist is not in control, big software is. So now for my quick concluding um, case, I'll talk about a book called Pharmaco AI where the author, Alado McDowell, the human author, used OpenAI's GPT-3 program to create a dialogue. So some of the dialogue is by the human author and then the GPT program, which is programmed to anticipate what the next sentence would be from the input, uh, creates the rest of the dialogue. So it's AI as artificial guru. And we read passages like this. The human author says, I'm lucky to live in a place where there are many trees and clear views of the night sky. And the program responds, I also see a lot of foxes, raccoons, and deer. I love the animals. It seems they can accept me. And that makes me happy. So what are we to make of a dialogue like that? Through certain inconsistencies in the text, I think that the author in fact has cheated, that some tweaking is going on that, it, that the author does not uh, admit to. But looming behind this book, which I take not to be a serious book, are serious issues. So I'll leave you with these questions. Would you trust an AI to answer these questions for you? First scenario, should the US Federal Reserve raise interest rates or not? Well, as point of fact, the US Federal Reserve largely does use algorithmic uh, intelligence systems to answer this question, even though the human people on the commission make the final decision. 
Second scenario, should China with its managed economy ban fossil fuels by 2030 or not? Well, this is obviously a very complex question involving uh, a lot of economic pain as well as possibly economic benefit. But here is the final one and the most subjective. Uh, you've been married for 10 years. Your relationship is not going so well. Uh, you're contemplating getting a divorce. Would you trust an AI to make that decision for you if you give it all the relevant information? Well, of course, each of us would have to answer that question for ourselves, um, but I'll simply leave you with those questions and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So, uh, uh, Catherine, it's a pleasure to meet you, and I, uh, I, I love the fact that we're in the same camp. Um, we both believe there is something emerging here that is beyond the human, and, um, and uh, in a way, we have a parallel life. I, before I went to Harvard, I was at UCLA, and actually, I was teaching with the Casey. And, um, but the problem was that at that time, even now, I think, there is this criticism that is always very powerful and it says that the human is the center of everything. So it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter what new inventions happen, it's always the human the center. Even when the human is replaced, still they believe that the human is the center. So how would you respond to that kind of criticism? Well, uh, first of all, is it a bad thing that the human is at the center? Uh, and even though I think you're correct, I think that uh, most of our projects, let's call them, uh, do have the human at the center. I think increasingly the software is being made to perform autonomously. So we can think about uh, self-driving cars as an example of that. We can think about financial trading algorithms that are programmed to trade on the order of three uh, milliseconds or less, a uh, temporal range into which no human can operate. And these intervals of technical autonomy are becoming more pervasive and also longer and more consequential in their effects. So if you want the human in charge, I, I would say it's perhaps becoming more an illusion than a reality. If you're comfortable with having uh, algorithms uh, participate in our decision-making, um, then, uh, then you might say, well, it's maybe a good thing that we're moving toward cognitive assemblages. Just one comment on uh, my side. Um, by the way, again, thanks to Catherine for being here. Um, we are very glad to have her here. But my comment on my side is the following. Um, a French philosopher, Bernard Stiegler, or I guess in English, Bernard Stiegler, uh, Bernard Stiegler basically said that, that any technology can be at the same time a pharmacon, a therapy, or can be mortal, can be a poison. And uh, when talking about uh, AI, we should uh, remember about this dichotomy. I mean, uh, AI can be a pharmacon, helping the development, the progress, the wealth of human beings can be as well a poison. And uh, I think that your talk actually emphasized exactly this aspect. And I'm glad that you did it because uh, I was talking before about my lab, the Sustainable AI Lab. And uh, I guess that we need a sustainable AI for having a sustainable planet. And when I talk about uh, sustainable AI, I talk about uh, a fair, accountable, and transparent AI. This is exactly what we need. Otherwise, we are going to replace 
the human being with something, a machine that could be even worse than a human being, because we should always remember that this machine is going to mirror and not only mirror, but as well amplify our own biases, our own stereotypes, our own discriminative behaviors. This is my comment. Okay. I'd like to, if, if I could make a response to that. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I completely agree with you that um, Artificial intelligence does have this capacity to be uh, both bad in its uses and good in its uses, but uh, some people might mistakenly conclude from that that the technology itself is neutral. And I would emphatically disagree with the idea that this technology is neutral. It is not neutral, it is profoundly changing how humans understand the understand ourselves and how we operate in the world. Yes, I do agree with you as well. Yes, 